the hearing will come to order. As this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you've not unmuted yourself, I'll ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. And when your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I'll begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, and then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we've set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. I now recognize myself for a five minute opening statement and let me extend a very warm welcome to our members and distinguished witnesses. My goal as chair is to help provide a better future for generations to come and I know you share that. I hope you will join me on this journey to sustain life on earth, starting in our nation with today's focus on fresh water to help seamlessly address the challenges of a new era. As you can see, the United States is a vast network of interconnected streams, rivers, and watersheds, underlying watersheds comprised of 18 major river basins. These systems have sustained the American way of life for generations, and they serve as the backbone for feeding our people and growing our economy. This continent was explored and developed on these same inland waterways that now annually carry 630 million tons of cargo. Unfortunately, we now face an historic dichotomy of water disasters, water scarcity in the West and water surpluses in the heartland and the Mississippi River system. Headlines tell the story. In the arid West, millions of people are threatened by water shortages that may upend their daily way of life. In areas like the Mississippi Valley, the Everglades, and in my home region of the Great Lakes, water surpluses threaten to swamp our city's drinking water systems as toxic algal blooms proliferate. Along the Gulf Coast, stronger hurricanes batter our shores more frequently. In 2020, the West endured an unprecedented year. The occurrence of historic wildfires, heat waves, and drought caused billions of dollars of damage. This photo shows water levels at Lake Mead have dropped the dangerous levels you can see the encrusted line. In Arizona, planes were grounded during 100 days of temperatures over 100 degrees during last year. 2021 will be no different. Most areas from California to Colorado are under extreme or exceptional drought conditions. In my region, the Great Lake shown here holds 84% of our continent's fresh surface water. Climate change has resulted in harmful impacts that have disrupted delicate ecosystems that have sustained life in our region. My district is located on the far southwest edge of Lake Erie at the southernmost tip of these lakes. The vast agricultural region located to the west of the lake, which is dark blue shaded, drains large amounts of fertilizer and manure into the lake, which has only increased as we have endured the wettest 12 consecutive months in 124 years. Each of our regions face challenges that look nothing like one another, but we all have common enemies, a changing climate and a rapidly deteriorating infrastructure. For our nation's sake and for our future generations, we must act boldly and reinvigorate investment in our infrastructure. Doing so, we will spur economic recovery, create jobs and protect the environment and public health. Let me applaud the water resources agencies under our jurisdiction the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation for they all have done and will do to meet the needs of our nation. The Corps is moving forward as this slide shows by prioritizing the Engineering with Nature initiative, which seeks to create new ways to develop a more resilient 
water resources infrastructure. In the photo, you see a proposed design of a nature-based jetty. It would use natural features such as marsh grasses to benefit the surrounding ecosystem and even raise oysters at the same time. Reclamation is also doing its part by incorporating climate change information into its planning process. I can't thank Reclamation enough for prioritizing basin, basin studies to meet the demands of climate change. On your screen, you see a photo of Glen Canyon Dam. This dam was constructed uh, in 1963 to harness the Colorado River and provide for water and power needs for millions of people in the West. As we move forward, projects like this must adapt and evolve to meet the ever-changing needs of the next generation. Many challenges we face are daunting, but it is the American spirit and ingenuity that will see us through into our next period of even greater prosperity and ecological sustainment. Our witnesses bring a wide array of expertise and we so warmly welcome them. And our subcommittee looks forward to hearing from them. And in many instances, the magnitude of what is required of federal responsibility uh, is ours because it is interstate and sometimes binational. I'll now turn to our ranking member, very able, Mr. Mike Simpson from Idaho for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Kaptur. Uh, I'd like to echo your welcome to our witnesses today. We thank uh, all of you for participating today and look forward to hearing your perspectives on innovation and investment in water resources infrastructure. The Energy and Water Subcommittee is responsible for funding the federal government's primary water resources programs through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Civil Works Program and the Department of Interior's Bureau of Reclamation. These programs provide a wide variety of benefits across the nation. In fact, I doubt there's a single congressional district that doesn't benefit from the water resources infrastructure supported by these programs. For example, navigation projects don't just create jobs at the immediate location of the port. They also help farmers to move crops and businesses to move products to market elsewhere in the United States, as well as around the world. Dams and levees and other uh, flood and storm reduction, uh, damage reduction projects protect people's lives, directly impact floods and hurricanes, but they also protect other types of public infrastructure, such as roads and drinking water and wastewater treatment plants, which are important to helping communities to get back on their feet after a natural disaster. Congress and this subcommittee in particular has long recognized the importance of these programs by appropriating more funds than proposed in the annual budget requests of almost all presidents. It has been bipartisan support also. It hasn't mattered which party has been in the White House or which party has been in the majority either in the House or the Senate. I suspect that dynamic will continue in future fiscal years as well. Madam Chairman, before I yield back, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include in the hearing record a, a letter from the National Water Resources Association and 11 state water uh, associations. We will place uh, that material uh, in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I look forward to exploring these topics with our witnesses and I thank you for calling this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Simpson, uh, and I think all of us are just chomping at the bit for a real recovery bill, and I'm excited by the witnesses that are joining us today. First, we will have Mr. Kevin DeGood. Mr. DeGood is the Director of Infrastructure Policy at the Center for American Progress. We want to underline progress. As an expert in his field, Mr. DeGood focuses on how our policies for various transportation modes impact America's competitiveness and provide opportunities for our diverse communities and environmental sustainability. Next, we will have Mr. Thomas Winston, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority. He is responsible for the development and implementation of the strategic direction of that port and oversees all aspects of their activities, including economic development programs, brownfields development, and other strategic activities of the Port Authority's multimodal facilities. Following that, we will have Ms. Bitta, De Be uh, Becker, an associate attorney for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. She's also a member of the leadership team for the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado Basin and has focused her career on water management frameworks and solutions that benefit tribal members and surrounding communities. And finally, we'll have Mr. Jason Uly, who is the general manager and chief engineer at the Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. 
He has served this organization for 25 years and is an expert and strong advocate for integrated approaches to storm water management. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today on America's behalf. Without objection, your written statements will be entered into the record. Please feel free to summarize your remarks in about five minutes each, starting with Mr. DeGood. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Chairwoman Kaptur and Ranking Member Simpson and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify. Water infrastructure facilities are essential to our economic productivity and national competitiveness. The Army Corps provides essential services to the nation, including flood control, navigation, and environmental restoration. The Corps estimates the annual economic value of its flood protection at more than $138 billion in avoided property damage and lost productivity. Corps projects and facilities also enable navigation and trade. In 2018, U.S. maritime ports handled 1.6 billion tons of cargo valued at more than $1.7 trillion. Each year, ports along the Great Lakes handle more than 100 million tons of cargo. And in 2019, the inland waterway system moved 515 million tons of cargo. The jobs associated with waterborne transportation are strong middle-class jobs. For example, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates that the average wage of inland water transportation workers is $67,000 a year. Unfortunately, federal investments have not kept pace with the country's need. The Biden administration has called for robust infrastructure investment and water infrastructure must be a part of any long-term recovery package. However, money is not the only issue. The Corps must take a leadership role in combating climate change, as well as redress environmental damages caused by past projects. Unfortunately, environmental projects are only a small share of the Corps' overall work. For fiscal years 2019 and 2020, aquatic ecosystem restoration represented just 7% of the Corps' budget. Improving ecosystem performance should serve as a foundational goal of all project planning with a co-equal claim on federal funds. This is especially true when it comes to flood control, where natural and nature-based design elements should take priority wherever possible over hardened gray facilities. The catastrophic flooding that occurred in many communities along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers in 2019 provides a powerful example of the nature, broken nature of the Corps' mandate and structure of federal funding. For instance, severe flooding in Atchison County, Missouri inundated more than 56,000 acres and destroyed 121 miles of roadway. The levees along this portion of the Missouri River tightly follow the river's course, leaving little room for wetland habitat and limiting the ability of the flood control system to accommodate increasingly high waters. Yet federal rules only require the Corps to reconstruct the damaged levee to its prior state. Fortunately, local leaders pushed the Corps for a redesign of the system to include a substantial levee setback. If the cost of land buyouts to facilitate the setback was well beyond the financial capacity of the local community. In the end, a significant portion of the money for the buyouts came through the Emergency Watershed Protection Floodplain Easements Program at the Department of Agriculture. And while the Atchison County project was a success, it's deeply problematic that money for the buyouts was only available because Congress happened to pass a disaster supplemental in 2019 that included money for conservation. We cannot hope to achieve meaningful environmental progress if the design of flood control and navigation projects do not start with improved environmental performance as an objective on par with economic development. The Corps must take a leadership role in environmental protection and enhancement, not simply make ad hoc improvements when all the pieces happen to fall into place. Ongoing environmental restoration work in Central and South Florida demonstrates the enormous ecological toll of short-sighted flood control and water development projects that failed to balance sustainability with resource utilization. As a result, we will spend most of the 21st century undoing the damage caused by the Army Corps in Central and South Florida during the 20th century. Beginning in the early 1960s, the Corps turned the thriving Kissimmee River into a series of stagnant pools in the name of flood control with devastating effects on wildlife and wetlands habitat. In today's dollars, the Kissimmee channelization would cost roughly 200 million, while partial restoration will cost more than 1 billion, a five-fold increase. The comprehensive Everglades restoration program will cost the federal government at least 16 billion and take more than 50 years to complete. This cycle of destruction and partial renewal could have been avoided if only the deeply talented engineers at the Corps had been handed a mandate to balance flood control and resource utilization with environmental sustainability. We do not have to choose between economic development and sound environmental stewardship. And when projects cause unavoidable damage, the Corps should compensate with restoration projects that provide greater habitat and environmental services than what has been lost. For nearly two centuries, Army Corps projects have furthered our national development. As important as this legacy is, the existential threat posed by climate change means that the Corps' most profound work lies ahead. The Corps must assume a position of true environmental leadership and any additional funding for water infrastructure must come with the highest possible standards 
for sustainable environmental performance. Thank you again, Chairwoman Kaptur and members of the subcommittee. And with that, I look forward to answering your questions. Very much, Mr. Dugua. Thank you for taking time for us today. Uh, Mr. Winston, please begin. Chairwoman Kaptur, Ranking Member Simpson, and esteemed members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the critical importance of investing in the nation's port infrastructure. My name is Thomas Winston, and I am president and CEO of the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority. Today, I would like to discuss how investments in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system and in the Port of Toledo support our regional and national economy. As one of the largest and most cargo diverse seaports, Toledo handles between eight to 12 million tons of cargo on 400 to 800 vessels that call upon our 16 marine terminals. Toledo is an important part of the binational Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system that in total supports over 237,000 jobs in the US and Canada while generating $35 billion in economic activity. The ports on the Great Lakes serve a critical role in moving raw materials, grains and other products throughout the interior of the nation in a matter that is economic and has a lesser environmental impact than other modes of transportation. The US and Canadian ports in the system do not view one another as competitors, but instead as trading partners in a supply chain network that has served the nation well for generations. The US Army Corps of Engineers plays a key role in the system by keeping the ports connected, safe to navigate and resilient. The Corps maintains our marine highway by dredging shipping channels, constructing and maintaining breakwaters and confined disposal facilities, and taking on massive construction projects such as the new Sioux Lot, where approximately 80 million tons of commercial commodities pass through annually. It is critically important that Congress maintain annual funding to keep the Sioux Lot project on schedule and to avoid costly delays. In fiscal 2022, the project would need $229.1 million in the core construction account. An additional $37.3 million is needed from the construction account to upgrade a pump well that will serve both existing locks and new locks. We rely on the U.S. Congress to appropriate sufficient funding so that the Corps can continue to keep the entire system open for business. I want to commend the committee for its efforts in recent years to expand appropriations for the core operation and maintenance activities. These funds are desperately needed because the navigation system suffers from a $920 million maintenance backlog. This backlog includes $375 million to dredge Great Lakes harbors and channels to authorize dimensions, $320 million in breakwater and jetty repairs, and $225 million of maintenance work for the existing Sioux lot. At the Port of Toledo, we rely on the Army Corps of Engineers to dredge and maintain Toledo Harbor, which has a greater dredging need than any U.S. Great Lakes port. Each year, the Corps dredges between 400,000 to 1.2 million cubic yards of material from the Maumee River and Maumee Bay in the shadow western basin of Lake Erie. The U.S. government derives a return on the annual investment to dredge Toledo Harbor in the form of more than 7,000 jobs associated with the port operations, $375 million in direct business revenue, $50.3 million in state taxes, and $129.5 million in federal taxes. Many companies throughout Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana depend on the maritime capabilities of the Port of Toledo. Without annual maintenance dredging, the Port of Toledo will silt in and vessels would not be able to safely access Toledo's marine terminals, having a devastating impact on the U.S. steel industry, agricultural exports, power generation, and many other aspects of the regional and national economy. Our Port Authority and the Army Corps has a long-standing partnership and work with other agencies, such as the Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of National resources to ensure that dredging is done annually and that there is a plan for what to do with the massive amounts of dredge material. The state of Ohio has banned the practice of open lake placement for dredge material in all of Ohio's harbors. For the first time in decades, in the fall of 2020, 
all the material dredge from Toledo Harbor was placed upland into the port's confined disposal facility instead of in the open waters of Lake Michigan, Lake, Lake Erie. The 2020 effort was closely coordinated with the Corps and the Corps dredging contractors. We had capacity for approximately 10 more years of material into the CDF in Toledo before it reaches capacity. The port, Corps, and other agencies continue to explore beneficial uses for the material. We need to shift the mindset and begin thinking of it more of a resource than a wasted product. The port is involved in several research initiatives cooperating with multiple universities at Toledo's Dredge Center of Innovation, where we are studying how well crops can grow in dredge material and what engineered soils can be produced with Toledo's dredge material. It is our hope that we can one day return the dredge materials to the agricultural fields from which it originates, as well as make marketable products and use the material for wetland construction and in other landscaping applications. We view these and other beneficial uses as opportunities. There are harbor regulatory barriers that the Army Corps and the state of Ohio would need to address so that more beneficial reuses for this material are permissible. Currently, to use material dredge from the federal channel in certain beneficial use applications, the Corps will require individual project permits consisting of a full NEPA analysis and other components that are costly, slow moving, and burdensome. The end user will always find alternative material rather than going through this permitting process to utilize dredge material. We are hopeful that the state of Ohio and the Army Corps can streamline permitting for beneficial use projects moving forward so that we can one day harvest material from the CDF for beneficial uses to extend the life of the facility beyond 10 years. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with the committee and I welcome the opportunity to entertain any questions now or in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Winston and uh, Ms. Becker, please begin. And then we'll move Thank to you. questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Captor, Ranking Member Simpson and members of this subcommittee. Thank you for providing me this chance to speak with you about the opportunities for the Bureau of Reclamation to address innovation and investment in much needed infrastructure in Indian country. Yeah, hey, my name is Bitta Becker, and as Chairwoman mentioned, I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and I'm an attorney with the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. I'm speaking with you from my office on the Navajo Nation, which is about 35 miles northwest of Gallup, New Mexico. And Chairwoman Captur, Captur shared a picture of the Navajo Nation when she showed Glen Canyon Dam earlier, so I appreciate that. Um, prior to my employment here, I had the honor of a lifetime to serve as the director of the Navajo Nation Division of Natural Resources as a political appointee of then President Russell Begay and Vice President Jonathan Nez, and I was confirmed by the Navajo Nation Council. As Chairwoman said, um, I have focused my career 19 years on water management frameworks and water supply solutions that benefit both Navajo Nation tribal members, other tribal members, and surrounding non-Indian communities. And hopefully that work has corrected some historical injustices along the way. Water is a critical unmet need for many Native American tribes and Alaska Native communities. Access to clean and safe drinking water is essential to public health, educational attainment, and economic development, as the two previous witnesses have already attested to. Today, roughly 400,000 people, nearly 30% of homes in Native communities across the United States, either have inadequate or no access to reliable clean water and sanitation services. So to put this number in context, less than 1% of the homes in the entire United States of America lack these facilities. 1% versus 30%. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown a bright light on this inequity. COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on Native American people and Alaska Native people. At, earlier in the pandemic, the Centers for Disease Control reported that Native people suffered COVID-19 infection, COVID infection rates at a rate 3.5 times higher than in the white population. I checked the website yesterday and now they're reporting 1.9%. 
Um, regrettably, uh, native and native people in Alaska, native people suffer the the highest rate of infection as compared to any ethnic or other racial group. And as this chart, as this chart starkly shows, a chart um, presented by Dr. Fauci in a presentation to the Indian Health Service, native people are dying at a much higher rate from COVID-19 than the white population. These devastating impacts are largely attributable attributable to both persistent racial inequity and the lack of public health infrastructure, including the lack of access to clean running water. While this is an appalling situation, the silver lining to this pandemic cloud is that we can build back better. By investing in water and wastewater infrastructure in Indian country, this subcommittee and Congress will be addressing the four pillars of the Biden administration. By funding the Bureau of Reclamation to design and construct water infrastructure in Indian country, by funding Reclamation's technical assistance program to Native American tribes, and ensuring that Reclamation is a leader and engages in a collaborative whole of govern of government approach with the Indian Health Service, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the United States Department of Agriculture, we'll be able to address the four pillars, which are COVID-19, it will address economic recovery by creating jobs in the short term and providing tribal members and surrounding communities the basic services necessary to allow them to work and thrive in the future. We'll be addressing climate change by ensuring that resilient, appropriate infrastructure is constructed that will be able to withstand the impacts of climate change and, and address the effects of the prolonged drought that Chairwoman Kaptur discussed earlier. And it will finally address racial equity issues. The number one indicator as to whether a person lacks access to clean drinking water in this country is race. A native person is 19 times more likely than a white person to lack access to clean drinking water. In closing, I'd like to share two pictures of the realities of the lack of clean drinking waters to home. Um, this is called water hauling. Um, the artwork is, uh, a beautiful picture done by an elementary school child in about 2008 and shows you how our children see the delivery of fresh water to their homes. The picture of the beautiful woman was taken last summer at one of the utility authorities water hauling station. She drives about 40 miles one way, two to three times a week to fill her, her containers with fresh water. This subcommittee can help eradicate the lack of access to clean drinking water in Indian country, and I'm confident that it will. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so very much, Ms. Becker. Uh, appreciate your uh, participation today. And I understand that our dear colleague, Representative Calvert, uh, is uh, with us. And I know he had a lot to do with our next uh, witness, Mr. Uli. And I would like to ask Congressman uh, Calvert uh, for one minute to introduce uh, this important witness. Well, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Captor and Ranking Member Simpson for inviting my constituent, Jason Uli, as a witness for today's hearing. I've worked with Jason to solve Riverside County's most pressing flood control management issues for nearly as long as I've served in Congress. Jason is the General Manager, Chief Engineer for the Riverside County Flood Control Water and Conservation District, which was established to protect life and property from flood risks. Jason has served the district for 25 years, beginning as a junior engineer and now manages the district's 250 person staff and annual capital improvement budget of over 100 million per year. In addition to localized flood risk management, Jason oversees the Santa Ana River main stem and Murrieta Creek flood control projects, two congressionally authorized flood control projects in my district. Both have had their fair share of challenges over the years and we've had to continue to make progress towards a completion uh, thanks to his leadership and collaboration with the Corps of Engineers. So Jason, welcome to the subcommittee. I thank you for joining us today and I look forward to your testimony and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Captor, Ranking Member Simpson, uh, Congressman Calvert and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. Uh, district was created in 1945 in part to partner with the Army Corps of Engineers on flood risk reduction projects in the wake of the devastating 1938 Santa Ana River floods. The nascent District Corps Partnership, uh, next slide please, uh, the, uh, the nascent District Corps Partnership would lead to early innovative projects such as the $2.8 billion Santa Ana River Mainstem project, 
one of the Corps' largest projects in a unique three county partnership to address Santa Ana River flooding issues at a watershed scale. The project will protect over 3.35 million people and in infrastructure such as the BNSF Railroad Bridge, which carries over 31% of the nation's imports. We are particularly thankful for the recent appropriation of 2018 bipartisan Budget Act funding, which is accelerating project delivery. The main stem is just one of many local and national projects that are becoming more critical as changing climate is driving catastrophic flood risk. The evolving risks are straining the capabilities of local agencies, and they are increasingly looking to federal agencies like the Corps for technical and financial assistance. To promote federal investment, larger sponsors are offering planning, design, and construction leadership uh, to accelerate project delivery and reduce overall federal costs. The next slide. And there are many shovel-ready projects throughout the nation that could benefit from an influx of flooding. One such project is our Murrieta Creek Flood Control Environmental Restoration and Recreation Project. This project provides flood protection to Old Town Temecula, the gateway to Temecula wine country, and an interstate destination visited by over 2.7 million people per year. This project will protect nearly 600 structures worth $1.35 billion, improve water quality, and enhance flood protection for Marine Corps Camp Pendleton, in critical sewage treatment facilities in the area. The need of this project was highlighted in 1993 when floods caused $88 million in damage to Camp Pendleton and $20 million in damages to our local cities. The district is actively partnered with the Corps to develop and refine an innovative project that enhances its local and national value by integrating trails, parks, and ecosystem restoration features that benefit endangered and threatened species. Projects phase one and 2A are complete and phase 2B is shovel ready awaiting funding. We believe there are also opportunities to promote national innovation and resiliency by addressing limitation and core authorities uh, through an infrastructure funding bill. For example, segments of the Corps' 1950 era Santa Ana River levees project were damaged after a 2010 atmospheric river event. Although public law 8499 eligible, the scope of repairs exceeded PL 8499's annual funding capacity. Further, the aging levy needed resiliency improvements and PL 8499 could only address enhancements to the damaged areas. The 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act has provided $56 million for the PL 8499 damage segments, but nearly half of the aging levy will remain at risk due to authority limitations. Lastly, I would like to touch on the Salton Sea. Its shores are shrinking and exposing disadvantaged communities, including farm workers, to increasing public health risks. We are thankful for your support of a core feasibility study in WERDA 2020, but also encourage federal support for shorter term shovel ready projects that can help stabilize the seas receding banks. These projects are representative of needs across the nation. There are many incredibly valuable projects that are ready for federal funding and legislative language that can entangle some of the unintended consequences of CORE's authorities that keep these projects grounded. Further, we encourage the subcommittee to continue to support public-private partnerships and other split delivery approaches that can promote cost savings, innovation, and leverage the full capabilities of local sponsors. The return on investment from core partner projects is tremendous, and the core flood risk reduction role has never been more important to our communities. As you consider wise use of investments in the water resources arena, I encourage you to focus strongly on the core's flood protection program and the communities across the nation who are partnering and bringing their resources to the table. The effect of these decisions is to grow the return on federal investment. Thank you for your time and I stand ready to answer questions. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Yuli. We appreciate your participation and I thank you all for your statements. Since this is our second hearing, I'll just remind members about our hearing rules as I mentioned at the beginning. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You'll notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining at one minute. The clock will turn to yellow at 30 seconds remaining. I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I'll begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with chair and then ranking member, and then members present at the time the hearing is called to order, recognized in order of seniority, and finally members arriving after gavel by order of arrival. A second round of questions may occur after all members have an opportunity 
for a first round. We will now begin questioning under our normal rules. Um, I would like to um, uh, begin with a question about investments. As I stated in my opening statement, nearly every region of our country uh, is facing common enemies of changing infrastructure, one that is aging, and the climate, and the changes that we see in that. Starting with Mr. DeGood, much has been said uh, about the need for incorporating non-structural as well as nature-based elements into our infrastructure investments. Can you please describe for us what this means and provide examples of how these emerging innovations can be incorporated into our water resources uh, infrastructure? I am particularly reminded in some of the discussions uh, uh, this morning about dredging. I have worked for four decades to try to get the Corps to find alternate uses for the enormous amount of dredging material that it takes up from the ports across this country. And it has been an utter failure. So I identify, I have such a high level of frustration, I can't tell you, I was on the phone this morning with the Corps uh, because of their Vicksburg station and trying to find the answer they give today is, well, we can't, you know, turn dredge material into a byproduct that could be reapplied to the land because there might be PCBs in it. And you mean to tell me that we can't figure this out? Uh, I was in a plant yesterday that blew my mind here in Washington, where they're taking all the raw sewage from 3 million people and obviously processing it, but turning it into a fertilizer. Can you imagine that? Semi loads of fertilizer going out of the DC water treatment, water, wastewater treatment plant. So I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. DeGood, uh, what kinds of recommendations can you give us and examples of how emerging environmental innovations uh, can be incorporated into our water resources infrastructure? Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I would say, you know, natural and, and nature-based features are really any landscape element that mimics a natural system to control the characteristics of a flood or a storm surge and reduce the risk of property damage, injury, or loss of life. Um, examples of this include restoration of freshwater wetlands and floodplains, um, using dredge materials to, for instance, reconstruct uh, barrier islands to provide both erosion protection and mitigate storm surge damage. Um, other examples include the stabilization of riverbanks and coastlines against erosion with design features that avoid uh, riprap, concrete, or other hard gray facilities. Um, there's been a number of decades of research that shows that uh, armoring riverbanks and shorelines increases the speed of water flows. It reduces vegetation and habitat that fish and other wildlife need to thrive um, among other detrimental outcomes. I would just flag a couple other, at least in the, the coastal arena, um, these natural and nature-based features can include um, marine forests, oyster and coral reefs, dunes, seagrass beds, salt marshes, and, and other structured and constructed facilities that again mimic natural features. And I think it's important to note that natural and nature-based features can be used in combination with traditional gray facilities to produce projects that have, um, that not only meet the underlying either storm damage reduction, flood control or navigation purposes, but also have superior environmental outcomes that would be possible with gray facilities alone. But I think to your question about the core and dredge materials, part of it is about just financial resources. And part of it is about, I think, changing the core's mindset so that they understand that helping port authorities and other state and local jurisdictions turn these you know, materials into potentially economically useful products is a part of their mission, not just you know, a side frustration or something that they get questions every now and then from members of Congress. It really has to be a matter of culture change and, and a formal part of the Corps' mission, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Winston, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I would appreciate your uh, thoughts on how our subcommittee can assist our nation's ports in overcoming some of their most important challenges. And then can you comment on how the interconnected nature of the St. Lawrence Seaway system, um, uh, what kinds of steps can we take to meet the challenges facing that uh, coastal 
uh, system. Thank you for the question, Chairwoman Captor. Um, as I alluded to earlier, I, I would say the biggest challenge that we have, particularly at the Port of Toledo, is ensuring the consistent annual dredging by the Army Corps of Engineers to take place at the Port of Toledo. Uh, this is critical for sustainability and continuity of commodities flowing through the Port of Toledo and its connectivity to the Great Lakes system. Uh, which has a, a, a tremendous economic impact for our region and for the nation in general. Uh, so specifically, I would say for our area, it's certainly the dredging and, and having a core uh, adhere to that responsibility. From a more uh, regional standpoint, I would certainly say that the funding and investment into the SULOC system is critical and uh, having support from uh, this committee, uh, working with the core to ensure proper sustainable funding. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a backlog of funding um, in uh, basically the core and particularly the SULOC uh, initiative. Um, we are moving in the right direction with some of the actions that this committee and the leadership of this committee has undertaken over the last few years. Uh, but certainly there's more to, uh, more to be done to ensure uh, connectivity between the Great Lakes uh, and a Port of Toledo and our other systems. Uh, with respect to the question uh, on the core and uh, some of the investment uh, and, and opportunities, I would certainly say, uh, perhaps as uh, Mr. DeGood uh, alluded to, uh, having a core look at other means and how to invest and ensure that the process is streamlined um, uh, within the core and particularly mitigating uh, uh, wetlands. Uh, I would say perhaps relinquishing the control uh, over material when it gets into the CDF and have the ports and state agencies, in essence, work together on permitting is a great example. And I'm sure that state agencies will certainly welcome, welcome the opportunity to work with local port authorities uh, to remove some of the barriers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have our Dread Center of Innovation that's looking at ways to have better utilization uh, of, of that dredge material. Uh, to be able to put it back into uh, useful and beneficial production. No, I know that my time has expired and I want to go to the next uh, member. Uh, one thing I do note about the court, they don't have enough environmental engineers. They have a lot of civil engineers. And uh, I think it's a real problem in the way that they think or don't focus on the environment as much as they could. Um, We'll wait till the second round to ask a question about the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, and I'll turn it to Mr. Simpson. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Captor. Uh, first, I just want to say it, this is probably not a question, Mr. DeGood. It's a statement that I found in your your uh, uh, testimony that I happen to agree with. Uh, I'm not saying I don't with the rest of it, but but uh, you're right in here when you're talking about the Missouri River and the uh, floods that occurred. You say yet. Under current federal rules for the levy rehabilitation and inspection programs, the Corps is only obligated, I would also add, and authorized uh, to reconstruct a damaged levy to its prior state. I will tell you, as former chairman of the Interior Subcommittee uh, and uh, Mr. Calvert as chairman of that subcommittee also, we've run into this with both FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, particularly when they had the floods there, the, the hurricanes in Puerto Rico. Uh, and they had to rebuild some of this system. And we were kind of going, you mean you can only rebuild it to the, to the state that just got destroyed by the hurricane? You can't strengthen it and, uh, and improve it? Uh, that just seems rather silly. But I guess my statement is this is an authorizing issue, which we always ran into on the Appropriations Committee. And we need to get this before the authorizing committee so that they can actually address this and allow, as you say in your thing in the Biden administration, uh, says build back better, because if you're going to rebuild it, you need to be looking at how can you make it better than it was uh, before it got destroyed by by a natural disaster. So I agree with where you're coming from there, but we need to work together to see if we can get the authorizing committees to, uh, to take a look at that. I mean, there's reasons why this language is the way it is now uh, that we need to take into consideration, but we ought to be able to do better than we're than we're currently doing when we're spending the money to rebuild. So I appreciate your uh, your noticing that in your uh, testimony. 
Uh, Ms. Becker, uh, I believe this subcommittee, and as I said, Mr. Calvert and I have both chaired the interior subcommittee also, but this subcommittee on a bipartisan basis places a high priority on fulfilling the federal government's tribal trust responsibilities, particularly with respect to the Bureau of uh, Reclamation's Indian Water Rights Settlements, uh, Rural Water Projects, and Native American Affairs Programs. I appreciate that your testimony explains some of the positive steps uh, you have seen firsthand from these programs. Do you have any additional ideas on how we can help the Bureau of Reclamation promote success in these areas? And are there lessons learned uh, from some of the programs or projects that might not have been successful that can help us moving forward? Thank you, um, Representative Simpson. I'm so honored you asked the question. So a couple of things. The Navajo Nation has extensive experience with Indian water rights settlements, and the Bureau is currently constructing what's called the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project. It, it has, thank goodness, started delivering um, clean drinking water on one of two laterals. The second lateral, which is the bigger lateral, is expected to be constructed by 2027. I think one of the challenges with the Bureau through any water rights settlements has been when these projects come to Congress, they're at an appraisal level study and they aren't at that final study. So there it's not uncommon for the Bureau to have to or for the for the settlement parties to come back to Congress and ask for Congress to increase the cost ceiling because the cost ceiling that was um, imposed in, in our case, in the case of the Navajo Nation back in 2009, and we're now in 2021, you know, the, the, the cost ceiling is reached and then um, expected to exceed. How we, how the Bureau addresses that, um, I think that's a more challenging question um, because the settlement process doesn't always run parallel with the process for getting these engineering studies done. So it may be at the front end, going eyes wide open into these projects and recognizing that there are, that we need to build in some sort of contingency to address the fact that these appraisal level studies are not um, are not the final the final design of these projects. On the programmatic side, the Bureau Reclamation, and I do want to say the Army Corps as well, they are full of dedicated, dedicated civil servants who want to help with local projects, um, at smaller projects. And I think when, when taking nationwide federal regulations and streaming them down into Indian country, and I would suspect that the other witnesses and the other representatives have seen this in their communities, in rural communities, um, um, employees, civil servants start kind of beating up against the regulations. Maybe the need is less than the, you know, the threshold that's set. Um, in, and the third part of the answer would be specific to this committee for the Native American Affairs Technical Assistance Program, um, which I can attest to, let me say, uh, back to Chair Women Captors' comments about the Bureau of Reclamation doing basin-wide studies. They also did a tribal water basin-wide study such an important document. It's an important go-to document for anybody who wants to understand tribal water. It's in the basin. The Native American Affairs Program was critical to making that happen. But it, for this committee, subcommittee's consideration, what the Bureau, the Bureau could, or reclamation, I should say, could be assisting more tribes with greater funding. Um, you know, to, that's, I, and I truly believe that they could provide tremendous assistance in local planning and local climate change issues that are so critical to making sure Indian countries projects succeed. I hope that's responsive to you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. We'll move now to Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks so much for having this this hearing and uh, uh, Ms. Becker, I agree with you that the reclamation could do much more for the tribes. So uh, I grew up, I was born and raised on tribal land in Arizona, although I'm not Native American. And um, we, we had, we were right next to a river, uh, the White River, and uh, we got our water from the river, but we couldn't drink it 
without boiling it first. So, you know, I know how important it is to, to the tribes to have drinkable water at, at, that's accessible for them. So this is an issue that, that's really, really important to me. And, uh, you know, I've discussed on the subcommittee many times that Arizona and the Southwest are experiencing record-breaking droughts and water has become scarce. These conversations about water infrastructure are so important and have been, have been something I've been working on for 15 years. Ms. Becker, I'm glad you brought up the unique challenges that come with water infrastructure on tribal lands. And I just want to know, based on your experience, why has it been so challenging to get clean, reliable, and safe water infrastructure built in Indian country? And then how can the B Bureau of Reclamation and the subcommittee work to begin to solve some of these problems? Thank you, Representative Kirkpatrick, and thank you for your service to Arizona and your previous service to this region of the country. Um, so the United States has historic, in the mid 20th century and early 20th century, the United States invested quite a bit in infrastructure development. That infrastructure funding did not seem to come to Indian country. Um, in the 1950s, Congress created the Indian Health Service specifically to address sanitation deficiencies. And I pause on that because I, I, I don't think sanitation deficiencies meant anything to anybody before the COVID-19 hit, right? We, what that means is we are starting from an unevil, uneven playing field as we enter into some, something called a pandemic. So IHS has been chronically underfunded. Then in the latter half of the 20th century, a central vehicle that I just discussed with um, Representative Simpson is our Indian water rights settlements. Those became a very, those vehicles became very important to getting clean drinking water infrastructure to some tribes. Every tribe is unique, as you know. Um, some tribes might be settling for fishing rights or other rights, but for many of us in the Southwest, we need those clean drinking water projects. They are very good vehicles, but they are not without their challenges. We discussed one, I discussed one with um, Representative Simpson. Another one is the time, the length of time it takes to get through the settlement process to an actual drop of water hitting Indian country. In the case of the Navajo Nation, um, we have entered into a settlement for our rights to the San Juan River in New Mexico, which flows into the Colorado River. The underlying case was filed in 1975. And as I mentioned, the first drop of water from the main settlement project was delivered last year. That's 45 years. So though that decade, decadenal process that we can't wait anymore. Um, to address your question about what the Bureau can do, for those of us watching and have done this for a long time, the Bureau does, they can build the long, the big projects that serve hundreds of homes, thousands of homes. Indian Health Service does a great job of building the smaller projects that serve tens of homes. The Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project is an excellent example of a whole of government approach that that are the technical people, I would argue, kind of forced to happen. They saw how these different programs could work together to make a whole. So the Bureau is building the big truck line. They partner with the Indian Health Service and with the Navajo Nation who build the smaller systems and who get water to people's homes. It's, it's really the best. It's such a great orchestrated process of how government can function at its best, partly because it could have happened sequentially, right? Kind of like what I've described before. We could have built the trunk line and then years later built the systems, but it's happening all at the same time. The Bureau's funding though is project-based. So, so how the Bureau works through these systems versus programmatic-based funding, I think is something that they're gonna have to think about um, as they pursue a whole of government approach. I, I think the fact that these groups are working together now and collaborating is huge progress. Uh, and so, you know, I thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, just know that this is very, very important to me. We want to make sure that you've got the resources you need to build that infrastructure. And I don't want the next generation to have to boil their water before they drink it. So 
Thank you so much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Congresswoman. Congressman Calvert. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you hear me all right? Great. Uh, we often, uh, uh, this is for Jason, uh, we often think about flood control projects through a parochial lens. Obviously, uh, with all of our congressional districts, we, we want to make sure we protect our, the, the folks' lives and property. But sometimes the national implications can be clear with projects such as the Santa Ana Main Stem Project. Can you describe some of the regional and national benefits associated with, the fully, with fully funding projects like Marietta Creek? Sure, thank you, Congressman Calvert, for the question. You know, Marietta Creek is, was an innovative project that was really well ahead of its time and provides benefits well in excess of uh, the NED benefits that the Corps uses to justify projects. And just as a couple of examples, uh, I would point out that it includes a very significant national environmental benefits and that this project includes a environmental corridor that's gonna connect national forests with state preserves they're going to help protect and, and ultimately restore endangered species and threatened species like the least bells, Vireo, and Santa Ana mountain lions. The project also includes elements of a national trail system, the uh, Butterfield Stage Overland Trail, uh, which historically in the 1800s connected San Francisco to San Diego and St. Louis. And this project will be part of the restoration of that trail over time. And then lastly, this project incorporates important regional economic developments through the incorporation of parks, uh, that have ball fields that could lead to the Temecula area becoming a, a national destination for youth sports leagues because of the adjacency of uh, Temecula Old Town and uh, wine country. Uh, but I think most importantly, you know, fully funding projects like Marietta Creek will accelerate the delivery of benefits and deliver them in a more cost efficient manner. You know, the, the way core, the core funds projects now, there's starts, there's stops, there's inefficiencies, new staff come in, and then they want to relitigate elements of a project. It's a, it's a very inefficient process. And if we can promote fully funding projects, I think we can deliver benefits faster and at a significant reduction in cost to both federal government and local agencies. I might also point out, Jason, uh, the benefit of protecting uh, one of our nation's largest uh, military installations at Camp Pendleton. Absolutely. So and, uh, we lost $80 million worth of helicopters uh, back in 1993. And so we had to uh, put together a, a significant amount of money to, ironically, that would have been more than enough money to pay for this whole project. Absolutely. And, and so uh, we need to, to protect that uh, institution also. You also mentioned in your testimony, uh, the full range of benefits associated with Mary Creek are not fully captured by the Corps' current economic model. What are some of the specific areas where Congress and the Corps can improve how we think about benefits associated with types of multi-purpose projects. It's been frustrating how they, they do those models. Yeah, yeah, the core focuses on national ex economic development benefit. And, and we really need to start with a recent memo that ASA James produced before he retired. And that, that memo basically directs the core to consider the full range of benefits, uh, other societal benefits, environmental benefits, regional economic development. That is a good start. But in addition to that, we need to not only present them but we need to incorporate them into the decision-making process, both with the core, with OMB, and ultimately with Congress. Uh, second, I'd point out that I think it's important that we take a good look at how NED itself is structured. Uh, the National Economic Development uh, Alternative can often promote projects that don't even provide 100-year flood protection, which is a FEMA standard and, and results in projects where residents still have to buy flood insurance. And so I think that's another area that's worthy of um, some investment of time. And then I'd also point out that these, these more multi-purpose projects tend to be promoted through LPPs, locally preferred plans, uh, because they don't fit well in the NED alternative. And unfortunately, uh, when the core evaluates LPP projects, they look at it from a total cost versus total benefit perspective, which, which completely uh, obfuscates the fact that local sponsors are often bringing a lot of resources to these projects and, and we really need to switch to an analysis where it looks at federal cost versus total benefit of the project and if we could do that i think that would enhance the delivery of more innovative multi-benefit projects and then and then finally there, there may be an opportunity for congress to consider a, a special fund or enhancement of a p3 program to be able to target money towards these types of projects 
to promote them and also to evaluate their benefit and, and maybe promote long-term changes to the core. Well, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Lee. Hello, did you call on me, Madam Chair? I did, I did, okay. Congresswoman Lee, you're next. All right, thank you, I'm sorry for that confusion. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the Chairwoman and Ranking Member Simpson for hosting uh, this important hearing and for all of the witnesses uh, for their participation. Hold on, I gotta do something here. Um, for participating. Listen, I think all of us can agree about that bolstering our infrastructure is important. And in theory, this should be bipartisan work. I think we all can agree that we need to make these conversations a reality. Uh, the recent American Civil a Society of Civil Engineers 2021 report card for America's infrastructure highlights the need for investment in our water infrastructure. Uh, I reign from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, home to uh, the Hoover Dam. So obviously this is an incredibly important issue for my region, um, but this extends to all congressional districts. And while I'm pleased to see that there has been some improvement in my home state in terms of our overall infrastructure, there's still a lot of work to be done and specifically around water. Um, for instance, of the five, 656 state regulated dams, 154, almost a quarter of them are considered to be high hazard potential. And as we move forward in this year's fiscal, this fiscal year's appropriations, I hope that we can work with everyone in a bipartisan manner to find some solutions to these problems. Um, I was uh, glad to join this committee because I think it's important to add regional perspectives especially as we talk about efficient water resource management. Um, my state is in the lower Colorado River uh, Basin where we consistently face duress from dry weather uh, conditions. And this probably has been compounded by the intensity of climate change that we're experiencing. Uh, Ms. Becker, I was pleased uh, with your testimony and you spoke at length about the drought resiliency program, which has helped your community to smartly manage water. Um, can you walk us through how this program has helped your community in developing a drought mitigation and response plan? Yes, thank you for the question, Representative Lee. Nice to have a neighbor um, to chat with. So the, the Bureau of Reclamation's local staff works very closely with the Navajo Nation staff in, in developing the drought resiliency plan. Um, and most recently, the, um, the Navajo Nation has, we have some tremendous young people coming home to work with us. And it, it, water hydrologist experts who have shared with me that climate change is affecting groundwater quality. So when we're thinking about climate change and drought, there's also a water quality issue that's part of this concern. So they, uh, they applied from the Bureau of Reclamation for uh, drought funding to address some water supply issues. One in Old Jato, which is where the woman, the picture that I showed at the beginning of the, um, today, that's where she's from. They have a very limited water supply there, a, a system that runs 12 hours a day. So they need to relieve the pressure on that. So that drought funding is, going, is part of the overall response that you were um, asking about. That funding will go help build a new well in the El Jato area. In addition, there's the second pot of funding that is coming from the Bureau this year and um, last year and this year from the Drought Response Program is addressing a long term project that the Bureau has been, or Reclamation, Reclamation has been working on with the Navajo Nation for quite some time called the Western Navajo Pipeline. In the western part of the nation, you know, not far from where you are, I mean, I, we're right in your backyard, as you know. Um, we are, that's where we have some of the lowest precipitation and we have some serious groundwater problems. So they are analyzing ways to bring surface water into the Navajo Nation. So 
Um, so these are ways that the reclamation has been so helpful in addressing yes. drought in our area region. I must say, yeah, I'd like to also note that the Bureau of Reclamation uh, recently awarded Nevada some grant funding through the Drought Resiliency Program. So we appreciate this work that the reclamation uh, department's doing with our partners. Um, my second question, I don't have much time. I really don't have much time, uh, Mr. DeGood. Uh, just quickly, can you talk about how green infrastructure can be used alongside or even as an alternative to traditional gray infrastructure with the goal of bringing multiple benefits to a project in cost efficient manner? Uh, that's a, a great question. I think it's important to understand that when we bring these uh, nature and nature based features and, and natural features into design, um, oftentimes we end up with projects that have either a lower total cost or a little lower total lifetime cost, life cycle cost, because um, natural features tend to need less ongoing maintenance. Um, and we um, often end up with projects that have better overall environmental performance. So it's so much about mindset. And when you start the planning process, if you only start with pure sort of navigation or flood control without considering what these other you know, benefits could be, you're gonna end that planning process with something that looks like the old kind of traditional gray facilities that we're trying to move away from. If you start with improved environmental performance at the beginning, what you'll end up with is a project that has a mix generally of traditional gray and green infrastructure that will again, typically be uh, lower total life cycle cost and have better environmental performance. But that's a lot about Congress providing direction and helping to change the Corps' um, culture and mission. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry I ran over. Thank you. No I yield. Listen, I'm so proud of this subcommittee. You have all been doing great. It's hard to talk within five minutes and complicated issues. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Lee. And now we're going to go to Congressman Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Simpson. Again, another outstanding uh, topic or set of topics. And to all the witnesses, thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, I know you've championed the Great Lakes for years, and I really appreciate that and look forward to working with you on Asian carp issues and, and the like. Uh, in the past, I've supported efforts to widen and deepen the Norfolk Harbor in Tennessee's neighboring state, Virginia, as many on the subcommittee may recall, I've been very enthusiastic in my advocacy for the funding of the Chickamauga Lock Replacement Project in my home district. Uh, these projects are enormously important for commerce and industry uh, in, in my home state, but I also know Tennessee is not unique when it comes to the economic importance of inland waterways. Uh, to the witnesses, if you could speak a little bit more to the role that inland waterway transportation plays in supporting the American economy. And I'll, I'll open that up for the witnesses. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that question? <laughs> I mean, I mean, softball. Say, yeah, I'll go ahead and just say that um, I think the story that we need to focus on here is really one about efficiency and the fact that our uh, water infrastructure allows us to move critical, um, not only agricultural commodities, but commodities that are essential to our national industrial production and our export sector and our balance of trade. And that um, when we have unplanned outages, either due to uh, facilities breaking down or because of shifts in weather and water volumes, we know that the trucking and freight rail industries can often struggle to try to match um, that unexpected surge in demand to move those commodities. And so even though it's not a part of our transportation system that is one that probably most Americans think about on any kind of regular basis, we do know that it has this essential role to play. And so I think it's incumbent on the folks on this panel and, and others in Congress to try to continue to tell the story, to, to highlight for people why it's essential that this be a part of any Build Back Better um, rescue and recovery package. Thank you. I really appreciate that response. Would anybody else like to address that? Representative uh, Thomas Winston here. Um, uh, certainly, I think the investment and our ability to improve our inland waterways will be important. 
uh, here, I, particularly as I refer to the Great Lakes and the system and the impact that it has. Clearly, the Port of Toledo has a direct impact to Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. Uh, but at our port, we have 16 um, um, uh, marine terminals. And those terminals supply products throughout the nation. We have ADM Grain Corporation and Anderson that's sending soybeans and corn across the nation. Uh, we have oats being produced, uh, at, at least uh, exported here in bulk material. We have uh, Mongolese that has the largest flour um, mill in the North America here at the Port of Toledo. So certainly uh, the impact of the, the inland waterways and, and as it relates to the Great Lakes um, not only has an impact from a regional standpoint, but certainly the connectivity to uh, across our nation and, uh, you know, certainly being able to uh, uh, distribute goods and services. Um, we have uh, Cleveland Cliffs um, as a result of uh, some of the initiatives that we've taken here. We have a, you know, the internationally known company now, Cleveland Cliffs, that made an $850 million investment in a plant here. Uh, they'll be taking in ore from uh, Minnesota through the Great Lakes to be able to provide um, um, the hot or um, uh, product for the nation uh, that will service Tennessee, um, the South, the West, and across the, the um, across the channels here. So I think your question is well served, and I think some of the initiatives that we've talked about earlier and the funding from this particular appropriation uh, committee subcommittee. Uh, to the investment in the waterways and the, the channels and the Great Lakes will be instrumental uh, for success across the nation. Thank you. This is, okay, uh, and my time's about up. So with that, Madam Chair, I thank you so much and I will, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Fleischman. Congresswoman Frankel. Hello, good to see you. Okay, thank you, thank you everybody for your uh, comments today. And I think these are questions for Mr. DeGood, but if anyone else wants to answer, fine. Um, I would, uh, first question is, uh, what, are, what are some of the specific aspects the Army Corps should focus on more at, uh, in regards to Everglades restoration? And will that uh, require a, a a policy change, a change in the law. Um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there are any major pending changes that are uh, to law that need to happen with that. I think it's really about making steady progress and continuing to demonstrate both the economic and ecological benefits of that project. I think something that most folks um, maybe don't know is they think about the Everglades restoration and the Kissimmee River and Lake Okeechobee projects that are associated with it upstream as being simply about maybe birds and reptiles or something like that, as though it were a side right. issue. In, in truth, by um, improving the flow of fresh water into the Everglades and by improving the rate of recharge to the underlying, you know, limestone Biscayne aquifer, you're actually helping to sort of stave off that saltwater infiltration that will be speeding up as sea levels rise and the total pressure from that sea underneath uh, uh, that limestone reservoir increases, right? So it's not just about the environment as being sort of separate and apart from the economy of South Florida, it's about making sure that you have water to keep that economy going. Well, thank you. I, I absolutely agree. I know those of us who live in South Florida think of it as our water supply. Uh, although we do love the Everglades National Park, we know it's a refuge for, for uh, many species. And obviously, when you don't have water, you don't have an economy. So I, I appreciate those comments. I also, I, again, uh, talking about South Florida, we have, as you know, a sea level rise. Parts of South of Miami are constantly under flood. Uh, any comments on what what you think are some of the best ways to, to protect our coastal infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, I um, I think it needs to be an integrated approach. And one of the things that's tricky about water is that it moves, 
And so if you do one-off changes or improvements in one area, you can actually create additional problems, you know, upstream or downstream for other landowners. So what we need is for the federal government to serve as a true partner, not just in a fiscal sense of bringing dollars to the table, although that's important, but I also think playing a coordinating role so that all of the jurisdictions in South Florida, as well as the state, you know, DEQ and other agencies can come up with a plan and a sequencing for those projects so that we do it right. Um, and so that there's the least amount of disruption and the least amount of what I would call unintended environmental and economic consequences. You know, one of the things I highlighted quickly in my testimony was the work that the Corps had done, you know, to the Kissimmee River in the 1960s in the name of flood control. But it was because you didn't step back to think about what the second order consequence of that channelization project would be that we ended up with this remediation bill that's, you know, more than five times greater than the initial cost of the project. So it's got to be multi-jurisdictional. It's got to not just be about funding. It's got to be about smart planning and sequencing. But you, I'm sorry, are you saying that it should be the Army Corps should be the coordinating uh, agency or somebody should be? We have to pick one. Yeah, I don't know that I would sit here right now and say that it has to be the Corps, but I think that should be a discussion to figure out who needs to take that lead role. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back and thank you for this hearing. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, Congresswoman Franklin, you've been at every meeting, I think. You've been fantastic. Uh, Congressman Russian Thaler, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And thank you to Ranking Member Simpson as well. You know, investment in our water resources and infrastructure is absolutely critical to my district. And frankly, it's critical to all of southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, as the easternmost gateway of the inland waterway system, the Port of Pittsburgh is strategically located to move freight to and from the Ohio uh, Valley and the northeastern regions. And, and Madam Chair, I know you're uh, aware of this because you saw it firsthand when you were in the district, uh, when we knew in southwestern Pennsylvania with uh, my colleague, uh, Connor Lamb. I think that was in 2019. I know you were there regardless. Um, I, I think you may have witnessed the deteriorating conditions of our aging locks and dams. And some of these locks and dams, I mean, they're from the, the 1930s, they need improvement. Uh, but as, uh, as a new member on this subcommittee and the Appropriations Committee on a whole, I really appreciate the bipartisan approach that we're taking when, when we look at this, when we look at waterway uh, infrastructure, both in corridor or, and um, the ecosystem perspective. But uh, just historically, you know, my district has benefited uh, from the prior work of this subcommittee, including the new start designation for the Upper Ohio Navigation Project, and then going way far back when I was actually like nine years old, uh, when, when this committee authorized the Lower Mon Project in 92, which is just set for completion in 2023. So again, this is, this is really critical for my district, especially when you look at the Elizabeth Lock, which is the oldest lock on the Monongahela River and a lock which all river transportation entering to and from my district has to pass through. So with this, I was gonna talk uh, and ask the witnesses some questions about the TNI package that's coming and the $37 billion funding for ports and inland waterways with my colleague, uh, Congressman Chuck Fleischman beat me to the punch, so I would just like to say I appreciate the witnesses answering that question. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll move on to another set of questions I have for Mr. Winston. Uh, Mr. Winston, in your testimony, you stress the importance that the multimodal uh, connectivity, including maritime, has with the economic development throughout your port region in Ohio. And Mr. Winston, all along the Monongahela River in my district, we have former industrial and, and brownfield sites, of course. So just a two-part question for you. I'm going to ask these and just give you the re remainder of my time. But with your experiences, can you elaborate on what it takes from both the public and private sectors to successfully redevelop uh, or have a redevelopment project? And uh, do you have any suggestions for Congress on what we can do to better assist communities in redeveloping? Uh, brown sites, former industrial sites along our waterways. And with that, Mr. Winston, I'll, I'll yield to you. Thank you for the question, Representative uh, Retchen Dollar. Um, uh, thank you um, um, for being with us as well. Uh, I think your question, and because I know it's in two parts, I'm trying to ascertain that uh, uh, here a little bit, and I'll, I'll try to answer that in abstract. Um, you know, certainly, um, I think the, I think it's important, I and mean, here at the Port Authority, we're a very unique Port Authority, 
Um, the state of Ohio provides us with broad powers. Um, we were established in 1955 as the first port in the state of Ohio as the opening up of the um, St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and um, since then, we've certainly continued to involve ourselves in maritime activity. Uh, but we, because of the powers that the state has afforded us, we're also broadly involved in economic development. We can buy, sell um, our property and, and really deal with that. And that gives us a multi dimensional aspect <clears throat> to do economic development by issuing uh, bonds and debt, thus bringing um, access to capital to the market for businesses. Uh, it also affords us to uh, use some of the expertise that we have in certain areas, such as maritime and economic development, to take brownfield, remediate, brownfield sites and turn that into economic development uh, working environments. And we've done that. Uh, I alluded to Cleveland Cliffs project earlier uh, that's on what we call the dry side of our um, port of Toledo. Uh, we've taken a old brownfield site, um, redeveloped it, um, working with the private sector. And now we have an $850 million investment here um, that uh, is generating uh, close to 200 jobs for the area. So I think the collaboration, if I can answer your question, I think the collaboration between the public sector and private sector is essential. We were able to do that with working with a marine terminal operator um, on the private side, as well as with the uh, federal organizations like the Army Corps and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and other economic development entity. I think a collaboration is essential to making these things come to fruition on the private side. You generally see activity happening a little faster than on you know maybe some of the um, issues that might present themselves at the federal side uh, so i think working together is essential and, um, and as much as we can shift down responsibility to the local letter uh, local level i think that would be advantageous to meet some of the Thanks, Mr. Winston. And since my time has expired, I already go back to uh, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Reschenthaler. You know, you've been a really active new member, and we're glad to have that energy. And uh, we need it from Western PA. Uh, and uh, thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. I appreciate you know, it. Now, it's all right. We'd like to uh, go to Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz uh, from Florida. And thank you so much for um, your faithful attendance also. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for this really important hearing, both to you and uh, and to Mr. Simpson. Mr. Good, uh, it won't be a surprise that my questions are for you, and I want to thank you for referencing the Everglades as a case study in the importance of sustainability in the development of water infrastructure. As you probably know, uh, given that I represent the area that encompasses the, Ever the Florida Everglades, um, I care a lot about it. In 1948, Congress created the Central and Southern Florida Project, the largest civil works project in the country. The Corps constructed a massive flood control system that enabled South Florida to develop. Unfortunately, as you note, the Corps did not really consider the environmental consequences of this huge ecological redesign. And now we've spent the last two decades trying to restore the Everglades. So I'm going to ask you my three questions at once because I want to get in another one. How can we be careful to avoid environmental damage like the kind suffered by the Everglades when we build water infrastructure projects going forward? And you recommend that the Corps should be required to implement compensatory mitigation projects when water infrastructure projects result in ecological harm, kind of like the mitigation that developers have to do when they destroy uh, wetlands and they have to mitigate that somewhere else. Uh, so how do you envision a po that policy working? Um, and then I've also, you know, I have joined the entire Florida delegation in the House as well as Senator Rubio in asking President Biden to request $725 million for Everglades restoration in his Army Corps budget request for FY22. We have to make these investments to expedite this restoration effort and fight climate change and create jobs. And job creation has been mentioned by several people um, as a benefit of water infrastructure development. So can you or any of you elaborate on how we can use water infrastructure to address other key national priorities as well, like economic recovery, and job creation, actually, like we did in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Plan. Um, thank you for the questions. I, I will say quickly, I know you've got multiple, that I think it's important to point out that the Central and South Florida project, um, first authorized in the 50s and then moved through construction in the 60s, predates the National Environmental Policy Act. And one of the things that 
that you know members of Congress have fought about for a number of years now is sort of whether or not we feel like there's value in NEPA. And I think that it demonstrates just how much damage you can do when you don't on the front end ask the question, what are gonna be the consequences of this bill, right? So the benefit of NEPA is that all of the substantive protections that Congress has passed, um, a lot of them in the 60s and the 70s, talking about the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, um, Historic Preservation, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prevents Congress from funding anything that's either directly discriminatory or discriminatory in its effects, right? All of these substantive statutes are important. And when we go through the project planning and review process, that's how those are surfaced. And NEPA's, I think, real value is that it pulls together all these different studies into one place and provides the kind of transparency that allows for true democratic and civic input into the planning process. And so I think we get better outcomes. We avoid damages that we have to, you know, spend a lot of money to try to remediate afterwards. So we should understand the value of NEPA in water resource projects. Great. Is there anyone else that wants to elaborate on how we can use water infrastructure to address other key national priorities? If not, then I will cram in my last question. According to the Congressional Research Service, and I'm going to quote, earmark moratoria appear to be altering the makeup of core and reclamation appropriations, particularly by reducing the congressional additions of specific projects to the budget and by Congress funding broad categories of activities rather than specific projects. As a result, some projects that historically have benefited from congressional support have received less or zero funding in recently enacted appropriations bills, unquote. I know I've run into this obstacle again and again on this subcommittee because of the ban, the power to fund projects has been given to agency staff instead of members of Congress, and agency staff don't always take local interests into account. So I want to open this question to anyone on the panel with the last little bit that I have. How do you think the earmark ban has impacted funding levels and even new congressional authorizations for water infrastructure projects? Uh, quickly, I will say that I think it is um, Congress should consider whether or not water projects that have received two stages of congressional authorization, one for the you know, initial investigation and then a separate one for construction should even be considered earmarks. I think that that process is fundamentally different from what happened pre earmark ban with say the surface transportation bill where you had conference reports that had literally thousands of projects that were attached to a particular account, but had never been actually vetted, had never received any kind of oversight, hadn't gone through anything nearly as rigorous as what water resource projects is, must go through. So I think th they should, in a sense, be treated separately from the general conversation of earmarks in many respects. Yeah, yeah. 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 this is, yeah, I'm sorry, this is Jason Uly. And, and I would agree, you know, projects get authorized and then they go through these, these funding droughts. And I think, I think one of the impacts of earmarks has actually been to um, depress the ability to fund multi-purpose, multi-benefit projects, because a lot of these multi-purpose, multi-benefit projects uh, score inherently lower than the NED version of the project. And uh, they may still be very valuable projects, provide better benefits to the community, but um, because of the very narrow way the core looks at projects, it, it, it tends is to uh, depress our ability to look at those types of projects and fund them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. You're back. Very good questions. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, now I'd like to move to Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is for uh, Mr. DeGood. Uh, the congressional district that I serve uh, covers the pretty much the entire northwest corner of the state of Illinois, um, also going into central Illinois. So our western border of this district is the Mississippi River. And uh, through the southern part of the congressional district I serve is the Illinois River. We also have eight lots and dams. So, um, and by the way, on a personal note, my front yard is the Mississippi River. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that inland waterways are often overlooked, but are so critical, uh, not just to the district that I serve, but also to our entire nation. Um, the upper Mississippi River system is the only river system that Congress has designated as a nationally significant transportation corridor and nationally significant ecosystem. Um, I really appreciate what you said in your testimony. 
um, where you stated the core must stop treating the environment as a separate business line. I applaud that. Um, a great example of the type of innovative project that you're describing is NESP, the, the Navigation Ecosystem Sustainability Program. Uh, it was authorized to, to modernize seven locks and dams along the upper Mississippi while also providing critically important ecosystem restoration. So, um, Mr. DeGood, can you please speak to the magnitude of investments needed on both inland waterway infrastructure and ecosystem restoration? That's part one of my question. And part two of that is, do you think that Congress should be using this large scale dual purpose model more often? Um, to your second question, absolutely. I think one of the things that's really interesting about NESP is that they took a, a system-wide approach, right? And so often when we, when we look at the kinds of planning that Army Corps does, it's through a narrow lens of a particular project in a very specific geographic area. And sometimes it sort of misses uh, the forest for the trees, if you will. Um, I would just note that currently there are 15 lock projects with an estimated total cost of roughly $7 billion that have completed all of the studies and reviews and are ready to be constructed as soon as Congress appropriates the funding. Um, completing these projects will improve overall system efficiency by reducing unplanned lock outages and expanding system capacity, thereby allowing tow operators to move goods to market more quickly, more cheaply, and just as importantly, with greater predictability. So as I alluded to earlier, I think part of it is about um, you know, education, because again, not a lot of folks think about the inland waterway system, but for members such as yourself that have it in their district and understand how vital it is to the environment, to recreation, but also critically to commerce, we just have to keep making that case and make sure it gets its fair share of a recovery package. All right, very good. Um, you also said in your testimony, um, you uh, referenced the 2019 flooding along the Mississippi River. Um, you know, devastating doesn't even begin to, to cover those events. They were, they really were catastrophic. And this is something, again, um, that I could see in, in real time. Um, for months, the, the, locks in, uh, the locks along the upper Mississippi were closed. Um, as you know, that literally stopped in its track the movement of goods, not to mention the property damage and the impact to the growing season for our, for our family farmers all over our region. Um, and while Congress passed hundreds of millions of dollars for emergency operations like dredging in early 2019, uh, June of 2019, the allocation of funds took months, took months. And so while relying on the emergency funding is never the ideal scenario to be in to begin with, is, is there a better way to streamline the process to get our communities relief faster in these emergency situations? Um. That's a great question and one I'm not sure I have a particularly good answer for. I, I would say in deference to the core, when you're talking about destru destruction on that scale, trying to figure out the process and the sequencing of what you can do with the money that Congress has allocated is not something I think that can happen maybe as quickly as we would like. I do think though that the project I referenced in my testimony points to a longer term issue of the flood control works that were built earlier in the 20th century don't really fit the kinds of hydrological cycles that we're experiencing now and which we're modeling to experience more frequently in the future. So I think the question is, are there places where we can go in and make improvements to the system so that it has a greater flood stage capacity so that we're less likely to have the kind of disaster scenarios that were experienced in 2019? And that again comes back to, we have to be proactive and say, Let's not just build things the way they were done in the 30s and 40s. Let's think about ways that we can make the system more resilient, but also far more, um, you know, have better environmental performance overall. And that, of course, touches on the very politically sensitive issue of buyouts. And that's why it needs to be an inclusive process and one that happens over time to bring landowners in so that they understand the vision that the core and state and local authorities have and can become comfortable with what the proposals are. Thank you, Mr. DeGood. My time has expired and Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you for your faithful attendance and excellent participation, Congresswoman Bustos. Uh, we're going to move now to Congresswoman uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman. Thank you very much, 
Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I really appreciate this education I'm getting here as a quick learning curve here. Um, Mr. DeGood, I'm, first of all, thank you to all of our witnesses. They've been excellent briefers and they've raised a lot of questions. Mr. DeGood, um, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, what the Army Corps of Engineers is not considering that it should consider when it is advancing projects, particularly the environmental impact versus any um, sort of economic benefit that is supposed to be derived from it? Because I have a number of small towns that you know may not represent uh, an, an economic advantage in any, any way, shape or form, but they can get wiped out pretty good in bad storms. And there are poorer towns and uh, I think we have a responsibility to them, but I keep getting kind of pushed aside on this issue. Yeah, I, I think as some of the other panelists have mentioned, part of it comes down to what are the types of benefits that the core is allowed to try to quantify and put a dollar value on so that it can be part of its its cost benefit calculation. And I think for too long, we have focused on the narrow issue of really property damage in a sense, because you know, from an actuarial standpoint, it was the easiest thing to go out and figure out, look, when we when we damage roads, here's how much it costs to rebuild. When we lose houses, here's how much it costs to rebuild. When we lose agricultural production, here's how much you know, lost value of that. And, and so it tends to be very narrowly focused on um, you know, property protection because it's harder to say exactly what spawning fish or wading birds or you know, other environmental aspects um, are, are worth. But I think that's wrong. And so there is really this question of, again, changing how the core does planning and changing how it calculates costs and benefits to be more inclusive, to have these integrated and more comprehensive projects. So even when these towns are not, you know, not very high, high end homes, you know, rather low end communities. Um, so the cost to actually doing something in, in those communities uh, which would save those communities or even providing alternatives to those communities are something something that's not even considered. Um, is there anyone else that would like to respond to that for, for a second? And then I have a question for um, Ms. Uh, Becker. I guess not. Uh, Ms. Becker, um, I, I listened to your re uh, discussion about uh, making sure that there was a drinkable water that was uh, brought into the Navajo community and that the infrastructure was was built up in order to be able to do that. And you kind of said that things are, are working and there's a whole of government um, consideration here. I have, my question is twofold. Number one is how far along are we? When do you expect uh, to have the infrastructure in place? And number two, uh, to what extent uh, are your issues with um, sanitation um, being addressed at the same time? Thank you so much for the questions, Congresswoman. So let me be clear, the project that I'm talking about covers one corner of the Navajo Nation. It is at arguably 30% done and the rest of it will be done. The expectation is by 2027. The state, Navajo Nation is the size of West Virginia. So we're, we're, we're just talking about maybe about a third, a quarter of the Navajo Nation mm -hmm. is what will be covered with that project. We have a long way to go. It is very hard to determine the number of people living in homes today without access to clean drinking water. And that's because definitions change or th th there's a long explanation behind that. But it, the estimations range anywhere from 20% to 40% of the homes on the Navajo Nation lack access to sanitation. So for the rest of the Navajo Nation that hasn't enjoyed the construction of that sort of project, um, we are years. If we are years and years away from sanitation. Are there, bar yeah. are there barriers to that in infrastructure being constructed other than the lack of funding? Yes, there are some regulatory hiccups that could could be addressed in terms of uh, how much for specifically the Indian Health Service could what kind where they can put their funding, 
And then there are continued concerns with land access issues in various parts, meaning it can take years to go through like a NEPA process to get permission to cross land. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Sorry, my finger's on the wrong button there, Congresswoman. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, I just wanted to just say something really quickly in closing. Um, I'd, I'd like to know those kinds of barriers that um, Ms. Becker is talking about, but I also like to know what we need to be thinking about when we talk to the Army Corps of Engineers about how it needs to envision it's, it's moving forward and its impacts and, and the considerations that go into those decisions environmentally and in the long term. Yes, uh, we'll work with you on that. Thank you so much, Congressman. I'm glad you're on our subcommittee. <laughs> I'm so glad. All right, uh, we wanna move to Congresswoman Herrera Butler. We go from one coast to the other now. All right, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And my question, my first question is for Mr. Yuli. Um, I thought that you made a key point in your written testimony um, about the importance of local involvement and engagement with the core on flood management projects. In my district, there is a project that has been underway uh, for many, many years, longer, certainly longer than I've been in Congress, um, in Lewis County, Washington, to solve a decades long flooding threat by, and it's by bottom up com a community led process, including, um, you know, everything from local council, city councils, uh, county, local stakeholders, more than one tribe. Um, I mean, it, it, businesses, it's really, it, it has really been a, a, an amazing group. Um, and while it's, this project is mostly state level um, with the Department of Ecology and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, I think we can take some lessons about the importance of the local entities engaging with their federal counterparts like the, like the core. When I first got involved with this, the core was dictating to the locals how this was going to look and what it was going to be. And it's taken a long time and a lot of conversations and push, but now we have finally flipped it to where it is this local driven project and the core is stepping alongside as a partner. And I was hoping you could share from your experience how crucial it is that the core work with these local communities and stakeholders when executing a core project. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Congress, uh, Congresswoman uh, Herrera Butler, I, I, I think we are finally turning a corner with the core and, and we're starting to see the core interested in true partnerships more than they've historically been. And I think that is going to lead to better projects. Uh, in, in, in our area, you know, having the locals involved and, and where you have capable sponsors, having them take the lead on projects, you know, we're, we're much more vested in the outcomes in a lot of cases. And, and the core, you know, in our LA district, uh, it's one of the largest districts in the nation. They're dealing with some of the most challenging projects in the nation. The, the, the staff are stretched and then they can't always put the time in. They need to find the innovative, creative solutions that are going to lead to the projects that are going to benefit our community and save money. And so I think taking when the core can take advantage of capable and interested local sponsors, we end up with better projects. We end up with better outcomes and we end up with ultimately cost savings. And so I, I definitely encourage Congress to consider promoting uh, local engagement in projects and then local leadership in projects where the sponsors have the capability, because it allows the core to focus on the, some of the more challenging issues that really require their expertise and allows the locals to really spend the time and resources to, to develop fully the projects in their area. And so absolutely. I think it's an excellent point. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, they're more attuned to the consensus, the fit within the community, where obviously the core's technical capability is unmatched and so important. And it does kind of divide up the work more to get some of these big projects, these crucial big projects done. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Winston. I am really struck by the parallels in your testimony with the ports and the terminals in my district in Southwest Washington state. I have 15 public ports. Um, along the Columbia River, which goes out to the mouth of the Pacific. Um, the Lower River Channel is a major trade gateway for the nation. It's, I think, the third largest inland waterway in the nation. It moves 60% of all U.S. wheat exports. Uh, it did in 2020. And just like your port, our ports uh, have to overcome 
a lot of hurdles to operate efficiently. And if our channel isn't properly maintained, growers, manufacturers in many states will be impacted. I'm especially interested in the opportunities you mentioned to better use dredge material for beneficial uses. So could you tell me a little bit about how you recommend streamlining the regulatory process to make better use of dredge materials? Thank you, Representative, uh, for the question. Uh, it certainly has been an issue for the Port of Toledo and, and many of the ports in the Great Lakes. And uh, particularly as it relates to the Port of Toledo, we have a very shallow port being on the, the western end of the, the, the basin of the, the Lake Erie. Uh, so dredging is, is quite uh, significant for us and important for our ability to continue to have vessels coming in and out. Uh, as I alluded to in my testimony, we've developed the um, Center of Dredging Innovation here, really cooperating, uh, collaborating with a number of universities, as well as working um, with the core to um, really look at ways to um, better uh, utilize uh, the dredge material and put it back in production. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of collaboration. I'm a big proponent of um, <clears throat> perhaps having some of the accountabilities more regional or local to better expedite uh, and execute uh, on these type of initiatives. Uh, so certainly having collaborations with our leading um, um, public and private institutions with the cooperation of uh, the Army Corps and other institutions will be instrumental in being able to identify ways in which we can you know, look at those materials and better put it back into the system. It's going to be uh, critical for our infrastructure and our ability to move commerce going forward. So I think collaboration would be the key, particularly at the local level. Thank you for that. Thank you. Madam Chair, you're back. I'm glad to hear that our ports have a symmetry. <laughs> oh, what happened there? All right. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to call on Congressman Newhouse. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for being in and out, but, but uh, you know, the convenience of uh, the video virtual meetings is everybody thinks you can have them at the same time. And so um, in one place, many places at the same time. But thank you. Uh, let me just say, if I could, uh, it's an honor to return to this subcommittee to work with you, uh, Chair Captor, and also with uh, Ranking Member Simpson, uh, appreciate both of your leadership on this subcommittee. And it's, it's truly a, a, a pleasure. I, I hope the panelists uh, can sense that, that this is a good committee, a very, very cooperative. Uh, we work very well with each other and, and I appreciate being, being part of it. Um, I wanna thank the panelists for being with us today and sharing your perspective with all of us, a very important topic. Uh, actually, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I was delighted to hear that this was going to be what we were discussing today. Um, uh, it's it's important. It's a very important subject about innovation and investing in water resources to everybody, uh, from Florida to Washington to Ohio to Idaho. Everybody has interests in this topic. And as has been pointed out by the, the folks that are presenting today, we have uh, severe challenges all over the country, um, uh, but I could boldly say that many of those challenges are centered in the Western United States. I represent a, a very rural an agricultural, agriculturally rich district in Washington. Um, many of my constituents, as you probably know, are, are farmers, they're ranchers, and then they depend on a stable uh, water infrastructure, not only for, for growing, but also for, for moving cargo on the water via barge. Uh, a lot of our wheat travels by barge. So water arguably is um, our most precious resource in the West and a reliable access is, is certainly crucial to our way of life. Um, so as we continue to debate the infrastructure improvements, I, I do hope that um, uh, we make investments in water storage and uh, conservation, delivery systems to, to not only serve today's needs, as you talk about a lot, Madam Chair, but also for uh, the future generations, our growing communities and those people that who we will leave this great green earth to at some day. Um, aging federally owned infrastructure, uh, water infrastructure has played 
plagued the West's water managers uh, for, for several decades now. It's estimated that 80% of the Bureau of Reclamation's facilities are more than 50 years old. And many facilities are over 100 years old or near uh, 100 years old. According to the Bureau of Reclamation, over the next five years, uh, roughly $3.2 billion uh, will be needed to cover for extraordinary maintenance costs. And if you go out 30 years, that number gets up to over $10 billion. In many cases, uh, local government entities like uh, irrigation districts, which uh, I'm a part of, have little to no access to affordable long-term financing for their share of, of these expenses of rebuilding and maintaining these projects. So that's why uh, uh, last Congress, I was very happy uh, to have included uh, in, um, in our appropriations a bill that uh, I sponsored creating a, an aging infrastructure account, if you recall that. It's within the Treasury Department and it will provide funds directly dedicated to making sure our infrastructure remains up to date and uh, efficient. In December, we made major progress when this language, as I said, was including that included in our year end spending package. So thank you for your support on that. Um, this newly created account will be able to be used by the Bureau to offer long term loans to water managers and operators of federal water storage and delivery infrastructure. In other words, this account will be used to address the significant maintenance backlog at reclamation facilities, projects that must be paid for by irrigation districts like the one that I, I represent. Uh, while this would be funded through appropriations, obviously to get started, the repayment of those loans by project operators and, and the beneficiaries would then be redeposited into the account and, and uh, revolve to meet other needs uh, in the future around the nation. So as a funding subcommittee for reclamation, we must begin to put away some, some funding for the aging infrastructure account so that we can begin reinvesting in our aging and vital Western water infrastructure. And this is a commitment by the federal government. It would be a huge win for many communities, but certainly those like mine that heavily rely on this water infrastructure for our way of life. And so I just wanted to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank you, uh, Chairwoman Captor, for allowing me to make some comments and, uh, on this very, very important topic. And thank you very much. And I'll, I'll yield back and balance my time. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Newhouse. We're always so glad to have you. Your background in agriculture is vital as well as the kind of trade that you do uh, in uh, the far northwestern part of our country. So you really are a very diligent, hardworking member. Um, I just want to make sure we don't have anyone else that's currently on the list. So we will move to our second round. And uh, I want to thank all of our uh, uh, witnesses again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And as you've heard from several people, including Congressman Newhouse, this subcommittee actually gets along. Every single person is a hardworking member. You will never see us on the national news as we do the country's business. And that's something for Americans to reflect upon, uh, where the hard work is done at the subcommittee level, uh, listening to Americans who really have something to say, but um, you can't get it in a three word soundbite. And uh, I just want to thank our members. We have had total participation today of our large subcommittee. That says something also. And uh, I just wish there a way, were a way to communicate this better to America. Before I ask my question, I also want to say to the staff who are listening, particularly to Jamie uh, Schimmick from our uh, a clerk on uh, the uh, subcommittee side, as well as Matt Kaplan on my own staff, uh, to uh, Mike Brain, who's done so much work, and I know Mike Simpson will recognize those on his side of the aisle. Uh, they've just done marvelous young Americans who are contributing and really having an extraordinary experience in their own young lives uh, to make a difference for our country. So I want to thank all of them and also for our members and their staffs. If you want to have fun, there's a great little film I was notified. It's about five, five minutes or something called Kiss the Ground. Congressman Scott, the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, actually uh told me about it uh so if you want to think about kind of challenges that we face in this new century 
that is a really well done piece. If you haven't seen it, you can just go to the internet and look at it and you'll have fun watching it. It's about regenerative soils. It's about water. It's about what we face in terms of carbon capture. And we all have a lot to uh, absorb and um, uh, improve uh, what this country does through our powers on this subcommittee. Um, the other thing I wanted to recommend is that you go to the website of something called the Washington DC, the DC uh, Public Works Department. They have built uh, right near where we work here at the Capitol, the most amazing building that actually works with wastewater, treats it, but turns it to energy and also a vast fertilizer plant right here at the edge of the Capitol. It is amazing. It is the new America. And I recommend it to every member of our subcommittee to take a look at that website and think about what that means for your community and for this subcommittee and our work as we move toward a recovery bill. All right. Now, in terms of questions uh, for myself, I would like to um, say to, uh, um, let me see, I just want to, I wanted to ask Ms. Becker, uh, I'll offer my two questions first and then we'll listen for the answer. Uh, Ms. Becker, recent, uh, the recent drought monitor shows that 80% of the West is in drought and 40% in extreme drought. Can you clarify for the record how much of that is actually on Native American reservations? Are you drier than most of the West? I'm just curious whether you would uh, express, uh, does that fit what you're experiencing? 80% uh, in drought, but 40% in extreme drought. How much of the uh, tribal regions that you are aware of are in extreme drought. Does that mimic the proportions that I've just stated? And then to uh, Mr. Winston, thank you so much uh, for giving voice to the Great Lakes today. Uh, we need to hear, hear more from the Great Lakes region. Uh, but I wanted to ask you in looking forward uh, toward uh, investments in a recovery bill, what can you say about multimodal links through the St. Lawrence Seaway system, working with our Canadian brethren to move cargo uh, with so many of our uh, communities, such as Chicago backed up, Halifax backed up. What kind of solutions can the corridor called the St. Lawrence Seaway Development uh, uh, Administration, what can be done there with multimodal to make us more relevant in this global congestion that we've been experiencing uh, and also as the shortest distance to the northern, to the ports of northern Europe. Uh, do, do you have ideas about that as we move toward a recovery bill? Maybe first, Ms. Becker. Thank you, Chairman Captor. The answer is yes. On the Navajo Nation, we are experiencing extreme, ex severe, extreme, or exceptional drought. And regrettably, um, for many, many months, you could see the Navajo Nation outlined in red on the drought monitoring. We are very much experiencing ex extreme drought in, in the Four Corners region of the Navajo of the United States. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you so very much. We will do what we can to help. You've been a very excellent witness and I thank you for coming. Thank you, Chairwoman. It's an honor. Okay. Uh, and also, um, Mr. Winston. Thank you for the question, uh, Chairwoman Kafter. Uh, certainly, I believe multimodal linkage, um, particularly with the great within the Great Lakes, and just from a national standpoint, will be critical for uh, our ability to move goods and services uh, across the distribution channel. Uh, we have a per very good um, system here, um, particularly at the Port of Toledo, where we have the port uh, connecting to several um, 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 first class tier. Uh, railroad systems, uh, and we have the, the the luxury of having I-80, 90 going east and west, and I-75 going north and south here. I think it's going to be critically important, as I mentioned earlier, uh, supporting the maritime functions and the uh, the Great Lakes through Sioux locks, the existing Sioux locks system, as well as the new lock system uh, that's underway. Uh, that's going to that's going to really be, I be believe, the core uh, opportunity for us to have the goods and services and commodities coming through the vessel channels. Um, that Sioux lot is very, very important. Um, there's a study that's being done that if if there's some 
issues within that SULOX that can, and for, I'll just say for a six month period, that can lead to unemployment of 10, 11 million uh, individuals uh, within the system, as well as the economic impact. Uh, and I believe looking at our rail system from the, for, from the multimodal standpoint, I think is critical as well. Um, there is a need to move with expediency uh, and having these systems connect with each other with the latest and greatest technology will be astronomical for our success from an industry standpoint and moving goods and services across the highway. Infrastructure uh, in essence is in place. We need to invest in some of these infrastructures that have not had the proper investment in the past. This committee has been great in doing that. Um, there's another committee, I believe, uh, that supported uh, port infrastructure, particularly the maritime uh, grant funding that helps the ports and other um, infrastructure that uh, have been utilized to help uh, multimodal. And I believe uh, particularly um, this particular committee and as well as some of the other structures that are in place, working with the private sector, but also working with the local um, uh, organizations like a port here that, that we really have our feet on the ground here and we can expedite things much quicker uh, if there is a channel and authority opportunities from federal straight to a regional organization or directly to a local organization to get things done in a more efficient manner. Thank you very much, Alan. For further uh, uh, clarification on the Canadian rail spurs that come into the United States and what the possibility is for cooperation with the deep water ports uh, in Canada uh, at Halifax and at potentially the Straits of Canso and what if it's economically feasible even. I'm just very, very interested as we move into infrastructure, what we can do working with our rail companies. So uh, there isn't time right now, but just know that I'm really interested in that. Uh, Congressman um, Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I don't have any further questions, but I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here today and for their testimony. Interesting subject that we'll continue to work on. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Congressman Simpson for just being a royal pleasure to work with. Um, and we don't always agree on everything, but we get the work done. Um, and uh, that concludes uh, this afternoon's hearing. Again, I'd like to thank our witnesses, each of them. Uh, for joining us today, uh, Mr. DeGood, Ms. Becker, um, Mr. Winston, and Mr. Yuli, I ask the witnesses to please ensure for the hearing record that questions for the record and any supporting information requested by the subcommittee are delivered in final form to us no later than three weeks uh, from the time you receive them. Uh, members who have additional questions uh, for the record will have until the close of business on Monday uh, to provide them to the subcommittee. And I will officially say our hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.